1963 or 1964, the famous Bob Dylan penned the words, for the times they are a-changing. And they were certainly appropriate back in the early 60s, uh, but my goodness, couldn't they be uh, appropriate for the time of when uh, Jesus was uh, rode into Jerusalem and when he was rejected as Messiah and his subsequent death and then the follow-up, his resurrection, and then his ascension into heaven. More so, even when he sent the Holy Spirit. Uh, Bob Dylan, if he had written those words then, it would never have been more appropriate. The times, they were certainly a-changing. Now, a couple weeks ago was Palm Sunday. It seems like a month or two ago. Uh, but a, a couple weeks ago, we celebrated um, Palm Sunday, and we talked about how Jesus had rode, had rode, that's a new word, had ridden into uh, Jerusalem on a donkey in humility, and he was rejected by the, um, the elites, the, the professional religious people. And yet the humble people received him, the humble people believed in him. And that is as, as true today as it was then. Uh, you will never believe or receive or follow or live in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, unless you're humble. The pride have nothing to do with an actual relationship with Jesus Christ because they don't need, they're a self-God. And, and so two weeks ago was Palm Sunday when we talked about him coming into, uh, into the village. And last week was Easter, and we looked at the scripture where uh, Lazarus had been dead in the tomb four days, and he there was a pause and I don't, I wanted to get more into it and it's it's worth your study to look into that where uh, Jesus had been quite a distance away, Lazarus had died and it was almost like it was, well, I'm sure it was part of the plan. And Jesus showed up He and as we saw um, uh, last week and also in the devotional this week where Jesus spoke with a loud voice. Uh, Lazarus came out of the tomb. And in that whole event, Jesus had this discussion with Martha. And I know some of you have written that I've added an I to that, that it's Martha. Well, okay, that's there's Boston for you. But Martha, she she was before the Lord Jesus Christ, and she's one of the ones that really got it, really understood who Jesus was. And, and they talked about the, the resurrection of, Jesus, of, of Lazarus, and, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Do you believe? And she's like, I've been believing that. Of course, it's it, it was not a dumb question. You don't, you know, the, all the respect do. Uh, but she is. She was clearly believing it and living it, and that was the thing that we really saw there in um, in in the discussion about the resurrection. Now, I think it's important that we take a step back and 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 take a look. The bird's eye view. The 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 uh, the the big picture where you have the Old Testament in the Bible written by uh, a Jewish prophets, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and preserved by the Holy Spirit. And then we had a, about a 400-year period, and then John the Baptist. And everything seems to pivot on John the Baptist, the forerunner, if you will. And then John the Baptist, uh, his cousin, Jesus, was born. And with the introduction of Jesus, it was, it, everything has been changed ever since. And so Jesus is now on the scene. He, he's growing, uh, and at about 30 years old, he, um, he springs from being a uh, carpenter, and he now manifests himself 
and doing the miracles. Uh, read through the whole book of John during this time. Uh, read it through several times. It's, it's just such a rich book for the intimacy with God. And so the big picture was that John the Baptist came, Jesus came, he came into the city on Palm Sunday, was rejected, uh, he was put to death, and then he resurrected, and then the follow-up to that is the ascension into heaven. Now, prior to that, he was having the discussion, and that's the scripture we're looking at today. Prior to his ascension, he's having this discussion. And in Acts 1, 6, it says this. I'm going to read. So when they had come together, Jesus and his disciples, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They're still looking for this uh, political savior. And, and he said to them, it's not for you to know the times, times of the epics of the Father, uh, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you, pay, this is big right here, this, this verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, where he just was with the woman at the well, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received them out of their sight. Let's pray. Father, would you reveal your word to us, your personality, nature. Father, may you, through your Holy Spirit, make us one with you through the Holy Spirit, and, and that we would have that intimacy and the fellowship and reality of, of Almighty God and the Creator being worshipped by the created. Lord, this is yours. Take it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this is, there's an interesting thing here. All through John, we've been talking about, uh, right from chapter 1, we've been talking about the believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and the receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ. And well, the problem is, is that Jesus was just ascended into heaven, and now they're all alone again. Well, not so fast, because in John 14, John 15, John 16, he specifically, Jesus specifically, talks about sending the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. Now, again, in, later on in that chapter, in verse 26, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, see, he's getting specific, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Now, I want to show you something. There are those out there that'll say, uh, the Trinity's a bunch of, you know, it's it's a myth. It's But there it's clearly in verse 26, because he's talking about people. He's, he's using pronouns. He says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, pronoun, he will teach you all things. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, in this one particular verse. And he says, we'll bring to your remembrance all that I have said. Now, let's, let's continue on over in chapter 15, and, and we'll, we'll look at that. It says, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also because you will be you will you have been with me from the beginning. Now, this Holy Spirit and the study of that is there are volumes and volumes. I have books and books and books here in my study uh, on the Holy Spirit, and it is just as rich a reading as you could ever have to see God in 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 the miracle of being in us. And 
the big picture that I really, I, I really want us to uh, uh, take away is the encapsulation of Palm Sunday, Easter, and then this follow-up with the Lord Jesus uh, ascending to heaven and then sending the Holy Spirit. It's it's really uh, it's it's very important for us to capture that image of the sending, the receiving or rejecting, and then the and, and then after that re- sending the, the the Jesus returning to heaven, and then sending the Holy Spirit, and he says there that he may be with you forever, and this is uh, this is good good theology. This is, this is good truth. Uh, in fact, w- next week we're going to get back to the woman at the well, and Jesus says that those who worship will worship in spirit, spirit, and in truth. And, and Jesus says that I'm going to send my spirit, the spirit of truth. And it, 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 that was in 1526. Uh, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth. Now, I want to talk, just, just insert a little bit about the unity between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because in the first example in, in chapter 14, he says that the Father will send the Holy Spirit. In, verse, in chapter 15, he says, the Spirit whom I will send to you from the Father. So there, 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 the Godhead is very much in unity. There's, there's no fragmentation. There's, there's only purity and, and sanctity and, and this, this beautiful picture of oneness. And why, it's, why the big picture is important is that that oneness is ours. Jesus said in chapter, he prayed back in, in uh, uh, John 17, when Jesus says, Father, I pray that they will be one as you and I are one. And, and so the, the essential element to this is the Holy Spirit being sent. Now, how does that happen? Uh, it, there's no hocus pocus. There's no um, having to go to Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim, which we'll get back to next week. There's no having to go to a particular altar or having a particular preacher. Uh, If a pastor is telling you he's the only one with the truth, run the other direction. If I ever say that I am the guy, turn around or, well, rebuke me first and then turn around if I don't. Um, there's no pastor that has the corner market on truth. The scripture is the truth. The Holy Spirit, as Jesus just said, is going to reveal. Uh, you, you see, the, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, he will teach you all things. I'm a mouthpiece. But I, I can just talk, I mean, if I could just talk about Bob Dylan, um, about uh, Motorcycle Magazine. I could talk about all these things, and, and there's nothing there. When I talk about the Word of God and things about God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will quicken those words and make them real. And, and that's why it's so important to hear good preaching, people that preach from the scripture and not their opinions. I have opinions. Who doesn't? You know, who doesn't have opinions? Uh, the, you know, it's it, a, a Jewish friend of mine had always said, whenever there's two rabbis, there's three opinions. You know, we all have opinions. Uh, but the reality is that it's the truth in the Word of God, quickened by the Holy Spirit in us, and, and that's what brings the life and, and brings the message so that we could do, like he said there, that, that not only will the Holy Spirit testify of Jesus, but we will testify of Jesus. And we'll do that either through words or we'll do it through deeds. I mentioned in Wednesday that a guy from our congregation, our missions president, Chris, has been downtown serving uh, the homeless, building them fires, bringing them clothing, bringing them uh, tents and, and sleeping bags. 
And, you know, he, he is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And it, sometimes you're the ear of Jesus. You just listen to someone. So he sends us and the Holy Spirit is sent, but there's a, there's a, let's get down to the, where the rubber meets the road. I never like that statement, but I use it anyways. Now listen, in Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus is talking about uh, this connection about how dads know how to give things to their kids, or moms know how, you know, parents know how to give good things to their kids. And he says here in 11.13, let me read this for you. If you then, being evil, we're all, there's no one righteous, none. Let's not pretend that we're, we're super duper, you know, human beings. We're all flawed. Um, you know, if we took your thought life and put it on the screen, you'd probably crawl uh, behind the couch. Uh, so it, when he says, if you then being evil, let's just call it what it is, that's who we are. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now he's not talking about asking for food. He's not uh, asking for that I'm more holy than uh, the next pastor, or that I'm, I'm better and more sanctified than my neighbor. He's not asking that. He's not asking for the best toga. He's not asking for the best sash for his, his outfit or the newest Nike sandals. He's saying that <clears throat> we know how to give good things, things are nothing. He gets down to it and it's the reality is that it's the Holy Spirit that we ask for. How much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those that ask him, to those who ask him? Now, the question is, have you ever asked for the Holy Spirit? You know, we talk about Jesus and, it, you know, it kind of rubs me theologically the wrong way when I hear people say, oh, invite Jesus into your heart. We're not inviting Jesus into our heart because he's, we just read he, that he ascended into heaven. So there's no inviting him into our hearts because he's in heaven preparing a place for us. So the idea of, of inviting Jesus, that, that's bunk. The reality is, according to Scripture, this isn't my opinion, this is Scripture. According to Scripture, how much more will my Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so it's, it's, it's us receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 8 back there in Acts 1, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, it is a receiving. And it's just like when Jesus rode into town on the donkey. He was either received or he was rejected. They either believed in him or they didn't. They either lived it or they didn't. Martha lived the life of a person who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is, do we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we willing to receive the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ and ask for the Holy Spirit to come and do what it just said, to come and teach us and remind us all that happened in Scripture? This is where it all comes down to. So the big picture is, is that Jesus came. I'm concluding, by the way. Jesus came. He was received by the humble. He was killed by the proud. He resurrected, giving new life, the empowerment and the ability of new life to be, to be uh, passed around, if you will. And then he ascended to prepare a way for us. And then there, he and the Father sent the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is there. He has not received yet. It's up to you and I to say and do as we read there in Luke eleven thirteen, ask for the Holy Spirit. So you're sitting there at home. Maybe you don't go to church. Maybe you do. I know it's been a while for any of us that have been to church. So the question and the challenge, if you will, is have you received? Do you believe? Have you received the Holy Spirit? How do you do that? You ask for it. 
Now, we're, we're all messed up human beings. And so it goes like this. Father, forgive me my sins. We all know sin. We, we, sin is, is not doing the will of God. And breaking a known commandment of God is sin. And so we've all done that. We, you know, we've all done those things. And so we ask for forgiveness of sin. And we ask that we would receive the Holy Spirit and that he would come and straighten up our lives and that, that we would now walk in unity. As Jesus said, Father, that, we would be, that they would be one as you and I are one. That's what I'm leaving you with. Uh, Easter is over. He is risen. He's risen indeed. The Holy Spirit is there for receiving. Have you received him? If not, I go for it. Go ahead and, and ask that the Holy Spirit would come into your life and make you new. It's that simple. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We need you. We thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus ascended, that he's prepared in a place for us. Uh, Lord, thank you for the lesson in Ma with Martha and Jesus claiming to be the resurrection. Lord, we, we, we choose to receive you. We choose to believe in you. So, send your Holy Spirit, release him upon us, filling us new, uh, cleansing us and renewing us and giving us new life. Father, we need that. We ask for that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a tremendous week.